It's time now for Call of the Wild, the official weekly coaches show of the Wenatchee Wild. Stay up to date with your team all season long with Call of the Wild. With head coach and GM Bliss Littler, here's the voice of your Wenatchee Wild, Arch Ecker. Hello and welcome to Call of the Wild, your weekly Wenatchee Wild coaches show. I'm Arch Ecker alongside Wenatchee Wild head coach and general manager Bliss Littler. Coach, there's been uh, a lot to talk about recently with regards of being thankful. It's been at that time of season. Yeah. We talked about the things we have to be thankful for. The players have talked about things to be thankful for. And as we wrap up what's been an amazing homestand, the good things and the good vibes just keep coming. Well, it's, it's they playing in the Wolves' Den. Um, great place to play. Obviously very thankful for all the all the home cooking that we, we have here. And, uh just the, the support that we get from the community, um, playing in a great venue. Uh, it, it, again, you're right, there's there's much to be thankful for. Getting a chance to have Surrey come here after the way that we had played there the last time, the way that game ended, I know it was, there was a little bit, bit of a bad taste. We talked about that last week. And the guys came out fired up, and they certainly showed that uh, they were ready to prove a point. Well. You're right. That um, last time in their building, um, it, it just what could go wrong did go wrong, and they took advantage of every mistake that we made, and uh, you know it didn't sit very well with us. Um, so, which which to me as a coach, uh, I think that's a, a good sign that um, our kids can, I guess, regroup. But you can look at a situation and just know that. We need to play better. We owe these guys, and uh, I have no doubt that. Um, well, and we we definitely talked about it in the locker room, and we talked about it several times. That uh, our our thing we, we we say it a lot is, let's give them the the best version of us, the best version of the Wenatchee Wild. And uh, I know there are a lot of scouts up there that, that night um, in Surrey and. We're, we're embarrassed. We did not give them the best version of us. But uh, last weekend, we were, we were pretty close. That was a pretty good version of the, of the Wenatchee Wild. Certainly. And I know it's a little bit of a broken record because we've talked about it, and it seems to come up fairly regular. There's times where the team gets in a bind, maybe as they did Thursday night, gave up the first goal, found themselves trailing, but still no panic as the guys are far too long in the tooth, as they say, to, to let that rattle them. And they came out, and they bounced back from that early deficit. And only, it was the fact it was the next shift. Yeah, yeah. It was, we got got right after it. That uh, You know, we made a mistake, and uh, I don't remember if it was a two-on-one or if it was a breakaway, but, um, again, their, their first shot was a great shot. And, you know, we gave it to the wrong kid. He buried it, and... Uh, but again, we we responded like a, a very veteran club, uh, and a little bit of luck too that we, we got we got her back the next shift. Yeah, it was Colin Burson with the redirection. They had Chris Jones taking the shot from the left point. And I know it's it's a it's an old hockey adage, but phrases become old and and reused because there's validity to them. And when they talk about throw the puck at the net, get traffic in front. They don't say it just to hear themselves say it. They hear it because it's sound advice. It works. Absolutely. And, again, veteran play by Jonesy. And, again, one, one of the best players in the league in Colin Burston, just to, with a redirect. That uh, Good things happen when the puck goes to the net. That, and I learned a long time ago that um, the puck's got to get to the net to score. I mean, it's, it, it sounds so elementary, but... A lot of times you stick handle a puck uh, around the perimeter and it looks good. The puck's in the other team's end for a long time. But if you don't get the puck to the net, it's not going in. Well, you know, the next couple of goals that helped to really create some separation for the Wild in that game were both basically living evidence of that particular phrase. You got Brendan Harris swats home a loose puck. It was kind of the same yeah. thing. You just got to get the puck around the net. Harris, a kid that knows what to do when he gets it. Well, that was not one of Brendan's more pretty goals. I mean, it's kind of a backhand swipe, whack at it, and um, you know he's in the right spot at the right time, and you know he did what you're supposed to do with it, put it back to the net, and you know he, I guess he was a 
in the right place at the right time, but um, again, he had to have the wherewithal of throwing it back at the net. And Charlie Combs is almost the same thing, a little bit more off to the side, but a puck that wasn't even really intended for him, it no. just kind of ended up near him, and he just spun and swatted at it and drives it home. Well, again, Charlie thinks shoot first. I mean, in every, everything that he does, he's, he's a goal scorer, and his mentality is, is definitely shoot first. And um, Whenever he has the puck, he's, he's a threat, so... Again, it, not surprising, uh, and, and we've had that good fortune that uh, our goals have, have come in bunches um, a lot this year. Wild kept their foot on the gas and then uh, and added a little bit of a punctuation mark there at the end. Alex Bates gets his first goal of the season coming down, on, and he was just sort of trailing yeah. the play. But Colin Burson, and we talk about him and what an elite player he can be, but for him to have the that sight, I mean, he probably you would think he's thinking shot because he had a good line of sight coming mm -hmm. down the left wing but instead he drops it off for Bates Bates on loads yeah it's his first of the year yeah that was that was good to see <laughs> that he's he's played he's he's played so well and again I'd describe him as a defensive defenseman but um, he likes to get up in the play also and uh, he, he's had several quality chances throughout the year and um, hopefully it's a it's it's a sign of uh, more goals to come for him but um, that's not something we we look for um, out of him, but uh, we'll we'll gladly take it when it comes. We'll take that goal to go along with his 20 assists he yeah. has on the year. Anytime yeah. you can get 20 points off the blue line, you got to feel pretty good about yeah. it. So a solid 4-1 win on Thursday night over the Surrey Eagles, and then he'd come back the following night. It's Teddy Bear Toss night. We talked a lot about that uh, last week and leading up to it, how there can be. Maybe just a hint of added tension on Teddy Bear Toss night because everybody wants to get that first one out of the way. Actually, it took a little while for it to come. Boy, I thought we played exceptionally well in the in the first period. We just, you know, the puck just we we just couldn't find the back of the net. That we were, it just seemed like uh, we we're just off a tiny bit. That we made so many really good plays, but then when it's time to finish, we either missed the net or the goalie made a big save. But. Um, well, then the longer you go, a little more anxiety kind of creeps in, and you, you try not let it where every kid knows that you don't want to have to throw those teddy bears after the game's done, that uh, you want to get those things out there. And But the longer the game goes, it starts to creep in your head, and you do everything you can not to let it creep in your head. But it, it, it's good to see that uh, once, once we got it that, um, boy, there are a lot of bears who are fired out on the ice. Definitely, you know, folks have been saying that even though maybe the crowd might not have been might not have been as large as some of the teddy bear toss crowds we've had, the number of teddy bears on the ice that people are saying that it's surpassed anything they'd seen before here. For sure, it was three truckloads that um, we've never had to use three trucks before, and um, again, it's great cause, and, and uh, again, it's happy to see that many bears fly on the ice. It goes to benefit Operation Santa Claus here locally. You know, it's interesting, the guy that got the goal is a guy that also scored the first goal of the year for your team back in Prince George. And he's one of those kids that we talk about every time his name comes up, and we're talking about A.J. Vanderbeck, we say every time his name comes up, he's a natural goal scorer, right? Mm -hmm. But it always seems like when we talk about well, who's going to score the first goal, who's going to score the teddy bear goal, like Vandy's not always at the top of that list, but I think he's making a case for maybe he should be. Yeah, the, <laughs> no doubt that. Um, I guess they are the two kids that I would say are are goal scorers that are natural goal scorers. I would I would look at Charlie and, and, and definitely at Vandy that those two kids that they have a knack when they shoot the puck, it, it finds the back of the net, and um, you know they both have quick releases and. Again, it, it should come as no surprise that uh, that he got the teddy bear, teddy bear toss goal night. You know, it's interesting that uh, for Vanderbeck, I think if he overlaid his goals over the top of each other on a video, I mean, it was probably 80, 90% of them are from that exact same spot. It's the same thing. Well, you watch him out in practice before practice starts, and he, ha he hits that the same shot all the time. So you're right, it, it's not that um, I bet if he did, I, you did, you what has he got, 19, 20 goals? Yeah. Something like that. Um, boy, I bet 15 of them have the same flavor. They're, they're all <laughs> in the same area. You know, one of the goals, 
I'm building to something here, but so we talk about Charlie Combs. There's a lot of goals that he scores when he comes off the wall, maybe on the right wing side, mm -hmm. just steps out in front. And it seems that teams have almost started to kind of sense that pattern and they're heading him off at the pass a little bit more. How long before that starts happening to to AJ and is to some extent is some of that indefensible? Well, I'd really like it if they have to, especially when we're on the power play, if they have to put a player out to where he stands, because that's kind of a long ways from the net, and that'd be really nice if teams started doing that. But um, you know, when you have a quick release like those two kids have, uh, you just have to find a way to give them the puck, and, and they'll make the most of it. So the other side of special teams, talk about the power play a little bit, but on your penalty kill unit. What's the most important thing? I, I hear guys I hear you talk about sticks in lanes. Is that the most important thing, or is it more important to try to attack the puck carrier? What, what's your focus on on the penalty kill side? Well, I, it's 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 several. I mean, I don't know if there, you can say one. I mean, but to have a, a great penalty kill, your best penalty killer has to be your goalie. I mean, it's flat out. If your goalie does a good job. Uh, on the kill, you, you have a chance. But from there, it's it's. I like to think it's it's straight lines, no circling. Um, straight lines, stop and start, lead with your stick, and then you got to be able to eat some pucks. You got to block block some shots. Um, you know, so those are those are the fundamentals that that we talk about all the time. Is you know straight lines. You know, lead with your stick. Start and stop and eat pucks, and then when you do get it, it's 200 foot clears. You know, when it comes to blocking shots, I would imagine that sometimes it can be more of a challenge than other times, depending on the kids or the particular group you have, because not every kid's willing to stand in front of a shot and block it. But this team, I've seen every guy in every circumstance up by five, down by five, doesn't matter, any situation. They're willing to st to get out there and block pucks, and that's such a I don't know. It, it has like a unifying effect too. When one of your star players stands up there to eat a shot, every guy on the bench feels it. Well, when guys see Dakota Raby blocking a shot, it, uh, it then it, then it goes to Charlie Combs blocking a shot. Brenda Brendan Harris, Colin Burst, and all of a sudden you're looking at. Oh, well, then Baker blocks the next shot, and I mean it's you're looking at every single one of them. They take pride in it, and you don't want to come to the bench being the guy that uh, gives it the flamingo, where you you let the puck get by and you lift your leg up. That um, there'd be there'd be some uh, <laughs> oh I don't want to say sharp criticism that might come from the coaching staff, but there'd be some definite definite playful ribbing um, and guys would really get after each other if, if guys wouldn't go down to block a shot. Well the Wild have enjoyed home ice. They are 14-0-0 on this ice surface here at Town Toyota Center. But now it's time to load up the bus and head up to Canada. We got a nice four game road swing. We'll talk more about that in just a little bit after this quick timeout here on your Wenatchee Wild Hockey Network. And welcome back once again. This is Call of the Wild, your weekly Wenatchee Wild coaches show. Art Jacker alongside head coach and GM Bliss Littler. So now we're heading off on the road. we got a four-game road swing through Canada. We're heading up to Coquitlam on Wednesday night. And I guess we'll start off with that one. That's a place that last time we were there, a little bit frustrating on the outcome. Yeah, we again. I think it was that was the night we got, I think it was 53 to 10, something like that. 47-10 yeah, shots on 10. goal. Yeah. That was, that was a frustrating night that we we played exceptionally well. We didn't give up a shot on goal, I think, in the last 28 minutes, something like that. Played off well, but it was one of those nights that the pucks had the puck had eyes, and um, their goaltender played very well. So uh, hopefully our guys remember that, and, and we go in and, and uh, we start the road trip off on, on a great note and, and pick up both points. No, one thing I don't know about exactly. I know they've got the World Junior A Challenge thing going on, and, and uh, Burston and Milliken have both gone mm -hmm. to for the tryouts. Uh, Coquitlam's head coach Barry Wolf is the head coach of the Canada West team. So is he not going to be there? Is he gone for, yeah, for the duration? Gone. Yeah, he's gone. 
Okay, so, so from I guess that may change Coquitlam at all. Does does that his absence on the bench? Well, yeah. Um, again, they've been they've been actually. I think that's the that's the last time they won is when they beat us. I think that's 16 games ago. Um, I mean, who knows? Yeah. I mean, who knows that? Um, I know that uh, their goaltender played very well against us, and um, you know, like when you're, I always worry about teams that are struggling when you play them. That uh, again, it's their chance, you know, playing one of the better teams in the league to kind of redeem themselves and, and show that they're they're good hockey players. And, so I think it's important for us to get up there and, and get a lead early. So that'll be on Wednesday, and then we'll make the first trip out to the island with a Thursday being a travel day. So Friday, it's the Nanaimo Clippers, and it'll be our first chance to see them this year. Obviously, uh, you know, teams sometimes can carry an identity from one year to the next, and sometimes they don't. But uh, that being said, what are we looking forward to when we've seen Nanaimo? They play exceptionally hard. Um, they're they uh, they'll get right after us. Um, again, they they always they have a reputation of trying to bump into, it, trying to disturb your goaltender, and just playing on the edge. And um, again, we had a we had a great game in there a year ago, and um, I believe we won in overtime there. Where uh, it's it's a pretty good environment. Um, again, they've they've lost a lot of players from a year ago, but it looks like they're starting to play some pretty good hockey right now. Another team that's playing really good hockey this year is the Victoria Grizzlies, and that's our destination for Saturday. So as we head into their building, again, the, the nickel scouting report on Victoria. Their goaltender is, has been ex ex extremely good all year. They've been very defensive. They've, they've, they've done a good job at limiting their shots, um, and they find a way to win. That, uh, you know, their, their, their record is awful good. Um, you know, they're, they're starting to pull away in, in that division. So, again, we're going to have our hands full. What's the atmosphere like in that building? They have a reputation of being a really good hockey community. It's, it's one of the best buildings in the league. Um, again, a year ago, they were one of the worst teams in the league. Uh, and they, the, the atmosphere was not good. Um, but it'll be interesting that uh, being one of the best teams in the league this year, that, uh, to see what their support's like. That um, we We're there in December, which is typically a, starting to be a, a real good month for hockey. Um, so, so we'll see. But uh, even though last time we were there, there weren't many people there, um, it's, a, it's a really nice rink, like I say, one of the nicer buildings in the league. And, um, you know, they, they tr traditionally do a, a real good job there. And Sunday afternoon, another situation that will not be terribly unfamiliar. We had to do something similar to it two weeks ago. We'll have a quick turnaround. We'll go up to Alberni Valley for an afternoon game, just like we did with Salmon Arm a couple weeks ago. So off to Alberni Valley to face the Bulldogs. And once again, here's the nickel question. What, what do we yeah. expect from the Bulldogs? You know, they're a team that, uh, that struggled out of the gate. Um, and it looks like they're they're making a little bit of a run right now that they had a last weekend was good for them. And, um, it looks like they're they're creeping around that 500 mark, and that uh, again, their 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 coach has a reputation for for doing a real nice job. That they're a structured team. That uh, they don't beat themselves. Um, so again, I think it's it's the whole trip. I think it's going to be very important to stay out of the penalty box to keep our legs, especially being we're down two guys with Burston and Milliken gone at this point. Um, the the more we can stay out of the penalty box, the better our legs are going to be. Um, and the the quicker we can get out and play with the lead, the better it'll be. You know, you've talked before. I mean, obviously we know the success the team's had at home, and I know that when we got back from the last road trip, you felt that your team had underperformed on the road and, and kind of feel a little bit of a drive to show that they're capable of doing better on the road. Now, a lot of times you hear coaches say, hey, look, if I'm 750 at home, winning percentage, and a 500 hockey team on the road, I'm going to end up pretty good. What is, where do you want to be on the road to consider yourself a successful road team? You, uh, you know what, Arch? Um, and you want to just prepare to win each game. I mean, that uh, I, don't, I don't want, I, I generally don't let other people define what success is for me in my personal life or, or, or professional life that 
Um, people aren't around every day. They're not, they're not around and see what we do in practice. They're not around when they have injuries. They're, they're not around the day-to-day business of the hockey team. And so to, to come out and artificially put a number on, on it, it's just something that I, I really I, I don't do. But, again, do I know in my head that if you, if you, can, if you can win 60% of your games at home and 50% on the road, you're going to have a pretty good hockey club? Um, and if you can win 70 at home, you're going to have a really good hockey club. Uh, and But I just think that the, the good hockey teams find ways to, as the season progresses, they find ways to win games on the road. That um, When you look uh, the last month and two months of the season, the best teams, it doesn't matter if they're at home or on the road, they find ways to win. Absolutely. Another big news story this week around the Wild Camp has been involving a player transaction. And I know this, people that that know you, know you. People that don't, well, maybe they do or don't. I don't know. But what I know is that you're one of the guys that's very loyal to your players. And every guy that wears that wild logo, it means something to you. Player movement doesn't happen willy-nilly or without a lot of heart and a lot of thought and and whatnot going into it. And with that, a, a tough choice had to be made recently. And so Garrett Nieto, in his second season with the Wild, was traded to the Springfield Junior Blues of the North American Hockey League. Devin Cooley acquired in exchange. Tell us a little bit about that transaction and, and what precipitated it and uh, what we can expect looking forward to it. Well, when you, when you make a move, you're, you're always hoping that uh, it's win-win that um, the player coming in uh, gets a breath of fresh air and plays really well. And you're hoping that the player that is leaving, you hope he gets to the new team and he has success. And with, with Gar, we know he's going to be successful. That, uh, you know, he's, he's had, a, he, he had an injury in the summer and um, injury in the, in the fall and just hasn't quite regained the form that... Uh, Maybe he had a good portion of last year, but again, we, after talking, we you know we just feel a, a change would, would be good for for him, and um, you know we just had to make sure that we found a, a player that we thought was that was similar that um, could come in and, and and give us a chance. But uh, again, he's he's one of the <clears throat> um, as far as a, a quality young man. Again, it's 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 always hard that. Uh, Gar is just a, a quality person, and, and that's what we want to bring here. We want to have quality kids, and if you take a look at roster moves in the league, we're by far the lowest. No one's even close um, to a number of kids that have, have have been here. That we we generally it's we don't we don't make a lot of moves, and when you do, they're they're always hard. But um, you 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 wish the player the best that's leaving, and then you you hope for the best for the player that's coming in here, and um, and you move on. That uh, again, there's. It's not like you're walking into Walmart and um, <laughs> you're going to the shelf and you're picking up a product. You know what that product's going to be. It's your. When any time you you make a trade, you're rolling the dice. You know they also. The thing is with Devin coming from another league, the North American League. Maybe you don't get a chance to see him firsthand per se. But on the other hand, so much of the recruiting that goes on. Coaches are well aware of who all these players are, regardless of where they land. Cooley, probably someone like many others that you have been tracking oh, yeah. for quite some time. Yeah, again, we followed him. We followed him for a couple of years here. That we've, you know, we there's a chance that we're dealing a little bit with Muskegon last year in the USHL, and that's where he was at. And um, we thought there might be a chance that he might be available and um, for this year. And you know, we we did uh, talk to. Muskegon this summer, and um, you know we really weren't uh, weren't I don't want to say looking, but we you're always keeping your fingers on where kids are at that that you like, and um, we know his agent well, and uh, you know, we he was one that tipped us off that he might be available. So again, um, wish both kids well. Devin's a good sized kid. He's a, he's going to throw a you know, a big frame in that in the net for you, and uh, you know. But I think he's checking in at about six five now. This is the last 
I saw on him. Yeah, it says 6'5", 185. So, again, he's a big, tall kid that uh, you know, he's got, got a lot of room to fill out. Absolutely. Well, we'll look forward to his arrival and joining the team for this trip. It's going to be a big swing through Canada, and you can stay up to date on all of it by following us on Twitter at Wenatchee Wild 1. Of course, our website is Wenatchee Wild Hockey. So do those things and stay up to date, and we'll do our best to keep you informed. That's going to do it for this week. This is the Wenatchee Wild Call of the Wild on your Wenatchee Wild Hockey Network. You've been listening to Call of the Wild, the official weekly coaches show of the Wenatchee Wild, a presentation of the Wenatchee Wild Hockey Network.